next talk is by Jennifer Hintos. It's an invited talk on eruptions and explosions of massive stars. Okay, great. Um, I would like to uh, thank everyone for inviting me to give this talk. Um, and it's been actually quite nice. Um, I'm a new, newly hired assistant astronomer at Gemini, and uh, I have been assigned a lot of TOO programs. So it's wonderful to actually meet and hear about the science that a lot of the programs I support are doing. So this has been really great for me, not only for uh, learning about what Roman can do, but also uh, learning about what other science uh, everyone else is doing it in the world of transients. So um, for my talk today, I'm going to sort of give an overview of the eruptions and explosions of massive stars. Um, while many of these are, examples of many of these are in our own galaxy, um, there are quite a few um, in nearby and even further galaxies that I'll explore. Um, and to start, I like to, um, start with a very, you know, our very basic picture of understanding of, you know, star formation and, and life cycles of stars in the, uh, in the universe. Um, the low mass stars are on the left, and this is, you know, what all of you, all of you 1A and cosmology people are excited about. Um, but I'm going to concentrate more on, on the right side, the massive star. Can I, wait, Jennifer, wait, can somebody else confirm that you see the slides moving because I'm still stuck on the first slide in my view no no movement of the slides ah uh, okay because i'm seeing them on my end move okay um okay well what we're gonna do then is we're just gonna use this can you see me change slides here uh, currently you're not sharing but i think when you only shared your screen we could probably see everything okay um, okay. Can can you see a move this way? Yes. So maybe okay. you can just <laughs> zoom a little, zoom a little bit out so it's bigger, and then we do it this way. No. Okay. Great. I have no idea why, but you know the tech gremlins are out. Um, <laughs> so, um, like I like I was saying, we're just I concentrate on the on the right side, the very simple picture of what massive stars. Uh, or massive star evolution, um, like I said, very basic. You form a massive star, it lit, you know, and massive star in this instance, we're talking eight to 10 solar masses and above. Um, and the, the general picture, you form a massive star, it becomes a red supergiant, and then it explodes as a supernova. Um, and uh, if you plot this on, on sort of an HR diagram and you, you watch the track, um, you, you just like low mass stars, you have a main sequence, um, and then as you turn off, you move into once hydrogen burning is done, you move to helium burning. Um, then you hit your red supergiant phase, and then you kind of uh, oscillate back to the blue side, and then finally you explode as a supernova. Um, and the very basic picture. Um, but back in uh, 1987, um, there was this event that did sort of question this straightforward. Uh, evolution of a massive star into a supernova, so 1987A. Um, and to keep as reference, here's that very basic um, sequence here on the left. But this beautiful uh, plot here showing the evolution of 87A from a main sequence star um, to into the red supergiant phase, but then back to the blue. And instead of completing this extra loop here to explode again in a red period, a red area, it, it exploded as a hotter, um, smaller blue supergiant. So that sort of was a bit of a paradigm shift of what we understand about massive star evolution. And as we observed this supernova, we started to see a lot of structure um, and quite a lot of circumstellar gas and material and evidence of, of mass loss or, or binary interaction or something happening along this uh, this phase here to actually um, alter the, during the mass loss process, during the evolution of the star. And um, so that sort of allowed us to realize there were some um, 
interesting evolutionary pathways that massive stars could take instead of uh, a very simple, straightforward. Um, now, this is only like a 15 solar mass star, so it's a lower end of our high masses. Um, as you go up, of course, these uh, become shorter and um, much brighter. So when we talk about mass loss and massive stars in general, um, we, uh, unlike sort of the low mass stars, a lot of the main sequence and the post main sequence is, is influenced by the mass loss. So that changes how the, the star itself appears, um, how it evolves. And we think about a sort of two different Two different models. So a single star model um, where you have stellar winds and eruptions due to sort of instabilities in the massive star itself. Um, but then, and, and oh, wait, now we're not going to be seeing my transitions, but it, it'll be okay. Um, we cannot talk about massive stars without talking about binaries. And in fact, um, you know, estimates are 70, 80% of massive stars are in binaries or born in binaries. Um, now, depending on how close they are, that's a, that's a whole other matter. But some estimates have also been that about 25% of the massive stars that are in a binary will merge. Uh, maybe 33% of those will lose their, their hydrogen envelope. And what's important about, about that is that during the uh, interaction phase, the roche lobe overflow, during a common envelope phase, and during the merger itself, these are all instances where um, dust and gas can be expelled. And so you get not only um, mass loss that is eruptive that you can see, uh, observe in the optical and infrared, but you get dust that obscures in the optical. Um, and so this is where uh, transient surveys in, in the infrared are very useful because um, you can see through what has been actually um, enshrouded by the binary interaction. Um, and sort of the same for single stars, depending on, on the mass loss there. And so that leads me to eruptive variability and or massive stellar mergers form these dense outflows and that inform, will uh, form dust. And so you obscure the, the star in the optical. So while for the hottest, brightest stars, even with some obscuration, you can still get some um, signal in the optical, moving into the infrared is, is a great tool um, to probe these post mass loss events. Uh, when we think about single star mass loss, um, you can sort of think about the different types of massive stars. So here on the plot on the um, on the right, we have the expansion speed of their wind, so um, their the the winds of the star, and then the average mass loss rate. Um, sort of our, our lower end red supergiants, um, yellow supergiants. Um, have smaller expansion speeds or have slower expansion speeds and uh, very low mass loss. As we move over um, to LBVs, which I will be talking about quite a lot, uh, so luminous blue variables, um, we have just our sort of normal quiescent winds that have quite large um, expansion speeds due to their um, low escape velocities because their, you know, their radii are much smaller. And then we have these uh, as events that happen uh, every now and then in these LBVs called giant eruptions. And it's where there is a huge amount of mass loss in a very short amount of time. Um, if we head out, if we had extended this X or this Y, this X axis axis out, then you start to enter the explosion regime. So when you have um, you know, supernova explosions, you get to the um, 10 to the four kilometers per second uh, explosion. So these are down in 100 and 1,000 as well. So yeah, LBVs have both a quiescent phase, so these winds, and, and a giant eruptive phase. So when we talk about mass loss um, in these luminous blue variables, we concentrate on both because the LBV winds um, can often the quiescent winds has happened steadily over time. And then when you get a giant eruption, it can be pushed into shells, um, the previous mass loss. And so you get these beautiful circumstellar envelopes uh, around uh, these bonafide uh, luminous blue variables here that let us know that there has been mass loss events, um, whether it be periodic or just a single event happening uh, in, in the past. Now, what, uh, why exactly um, 
are we dis discussing these LBVs um, and these supernova imposters? And it sort of boils down to, um, and this beautiful uh, plot by Brad Zinko here, um, that if you look in the um, phase magnitude space of transients, um, we've been talking a lot about in the last couple of days, super TDEs and super luminous supernovae. So they're all up here in this, you know, absolute magnitude peak of minus 20, minus 24. So these are gonna be bright, easy to see um, targets. And then as you go, down in luminosity, you get to the classical novae. Um, and then this is 1309 SCO, which we just saw the, the light curve of. And sort of in this regime with these um, new dedicated transient surveys over the past couple of decades, there's been a whole area of transients discovered um, that seem to stem from massive star mass loss um, that, that are fainter than core collapse supernovae, but have generally um, long, long, classical or characteristic time scales there. And if we uh, sort of plot this up with some events listed, um, so you have our faint supernova here, and then so 87A is just above that, but you can see um, that there is uh, mass loss. There had to have been mass loss previous to the actual supernova event. Um, if we head down in luminosity, we get to these luminous red novae, which I will be talking about a little bit later on. Um, and then of course the quintessential Eta Car eruption um, is it's an LBV in this supernova imposter range, but all of them show um, circumstellar shells. They show uh, bubbles and all sorts of mass loss uh, uh, that show actually evidence of previous mass loss events. <clears throat> So luminous blue variables, in, um, we don't, except for the fact that they're luminous and blue and they vary, we don't really know the exact mechanism of their instabilities. Um, and all of this is right now is of course with a grain of salt, assuming that these are single massive stars that evolve uh, in a vacuum by themselves without any interaction with other stars, which we uh, assume is not the case actually. Um, they're actually a diverse class of objects. So they have a wide range of variabilities, um, both in, in their um, light curves and in their, uh, so in their light curves, both in the time and the magnitude. We think that you have to be at least about 20 solar masses to uh, get to a luminous blue variable stage, but they're um, defined uh, by basically changing their temperature while staying at a relatively same, a similar bolometric uh, magnitude. So they, they shift into um, from, from blue faint stages to red uh, brighter stages. And you can see um, in this plot here on the left um, that so uh, one of the well-known LBVs, um, R71, in its eruptive stage um, actually did increase its bolometric luminosity. So that seems to be a point that maybe LBVs do not have to stay at a, or do not stay at a constant bolometric luminosity, um, but got much uh, cooler. So it became a much redder object there. When we look at the light curves of these objects, um, while they have sort of these normal one to two magnitude um, oscillations and brightness, um, every now and then they will have um, giant eruptions and the giant eruptions uh, have show a extreme mass loss and an increase in the bolometric luminosity. So instead of um, the, the smaller LBV oscillations that I just showed, these are these are main events. Um, and in some of these cases, you can lose more mass in the single eruptive event than over the whole lifetime on the main sequence of mass loss. Um, as you can see in these light curves, uh, that sort of that lined up uh, at maximum of a lot of LBB and LBB candidates. Um, and the difference between an LBB candidate and an LBB is an LBB has actually shown one of these giant eruptions um, and a candidate has not. The candidate may look similar to known LBBs in its spectroscopy. It may have these beautiful um, circumstellar envelopes, but we haven't seen this massive event. So they're still gonna be called candidates even though we're pretty sure they are LBBs. Um, but as you can see, a lot of them have a ramp up in magnitude prior to uh, a slow ramp and then a very brief or, or very quick brightening um, and then a slow fall so that over years there is an outburst happening. Uh, but the main thing to also remember here is that 
these are non-terminal. So the progenitor survives the event. And of course, uh, one of the most famous giant eruptions or is the great eruption of Eta Car. So you, here you can see the Homunculus Nebula and the Carina Nebula here. Um, and the wonderful thing about this great eruption is that we have historical data. Um, so this wonderful light curve uh, going back to 1650. So you can get a, a rough estimate of how bright it is in quiescence. And then the great eruption that happened between 1838 and 1858, where some estimates are that 10 to 20 solar masses of uh, gas and dust were ejected. And so this is a great um, example of a great eruption here in Ada Carr. Now, when you actually look at the, um, the system itself, um, Ada Carr itself is a binary. So there's Ada Carr A, which is, is our main um, LBV, and then Ada Carr B, which we believe is a wolf rayet star. Um, so it isn't a colliding wind binary. The, eccentric, the eccentricity is about 0.9. So you can see here the semi-major axis uh, of the system, and it's about a five and a half year orbit. So this is a very interesting object that is a known binary. It's an LBV in a known binary. During the Great Eruption, it was the most luminous um, star in the Milky Way. Um, and we think the total mass is about 120 solar masses, so about 90 for Eta Car A, the LBV, and then about 30 for the Wolf Riot star. And I love this this um, this schematic here that where if you put Eta Car A the Sun and then Eta Car B would be about the distance of Mars, so that's how close these guys get. And then this is a nice scale to each other and to the Sun, so you can see how much larger than the Sun um, these LBVs actually are. Now. Even more interesting is the fact that Eta Car is a binary system now, um, but there is a possibility that the Great Eruption um, could have been potentially helped along as a because it was part of a merger, so that Eta Car, the Eta Car system, may have possibly been in a um, tertiary system. And this is a, a, a rough sketch of, of something that may have possibly happened um, to cause the Great Eruption here is that you have a tertiary system. Um, so you have the initial primary donor star um, putting mass onto the, the gainer, the secondary, and then you have this wide companion here. And basically the orbit of the binary will widen as the, the mass is transferred over. And so now your, your donor, your primary donor star is now the stripped Wolverine star. You have a blue straggler. And then as the wide companion swings around, something happens. And it exchanges a position with our actual gainer. Um, and so this wide companion that started out around here actually uh, merges with our, our blue star. And then our stripped Wolf Rayet star gets pushed out. And so you're left, um, these merge, you're left with Eta Car A, and then you have Eta Car B here in this very eccentric orbit. Um, so this is a, a, a possibility, but also during uh, all of these stages, you're losing mass, and then during the actual merger, you, you can have this explosive um, eruption during, during the Great Eruption. And so this sort of bridges the gap between these uh, bright LBV single stars and these um, luminous red novae, um, which are believed to be merger products. And these objects are interesting in the fact that they can span a, a huge range in, in absolute magnitude, in, and that seems to be a function of the actual uh, masses of the merger components of the stars in the system. And what sort of distinguishes them from other transients is um, that they generally show a double peaked light curve. And the reason for that has to do with um, the merger itself and the, the, um, uh, the, the mass loss in the plane and sort of a very basic um, uh, understanding is that the first peak is actually the um, expanding shock from, from the poles. And then as the, the expanding flash from the poles from the cooling envelope, but then um, as the shock runs into your uh, axisymmetric um, dust here, then you get that second bump of kinetic energy as the shock runs into the pre-existing dust there. 
And you can see that all of these are potential merger events. I mean, 1309 SCO we know is a merger. The others are possibilities, um, but you do see these double, these double peaks there. And one of the more massive um, stars are, uh, or transients is NGC 4490. And that's this guy here. And you can see there's a huge, not only is it bright, but there's a huge difference in time, about 200 days between the first peak and the second peak, um, while um, some of these less massive and fainter um, components only have, um, you know, 50 to 100 days between them. Its progenitor was very blue and luminous. So even though these are called luminous red novae, um, it seems like some progenitors can be quite, quite blue. And as you watch these evolve with time in, in both in, in the spectroscopy and in the color, um, the very the first peak, the red peak, um, is is actually very blue because it um, it's still a hotter and has, has a lot of emission lines. But then as you move to the second peak in the light curve, um, the spectra become much, much redder. Um, and the emission lines are not as strong. And then by late phases, you're actually seeing molecules begin to form and, and dust form and they dominate the spectra there. Um, so this is, is 4490 here, so the one I just showed, but then this is 1309 SCO and you can see um, that it, even though it's less massive, you're still getting these molecules and this sort of evolution. Um, if 4490 was a very blue object, it's it's very interesting that the temperatures are cool enough at the late phases to actually form these molecules. Okay. Um, if you just one of the interesting takeaways from the luminous red novae is the fact that if you plot these up as peak magnitude versus uh, estimated progenitor mass, it does look like the uh, more the brighter targets seem to have more massive components. And these are very interesting objects to follow in the IR because while they do uh, peak in the um, in the optical during the actual eruption, um, as it evolves, it does get redder and redder, and you as you get those molecules and dusts forming. One other thing to mention is that um, some of these objects can have outbursts and then become terminal events. So while they are, the first eruption is a non-terminal event, it could lead to an actual terminal event. And this is uh, really something that we've been noticing quite a lot um, and finding in surveys. There's still not a huge sample, but it does seem to be there's a group of objects that have some sort of eruption uh, or some sort of of outbursts about 40 or 50 days before there's a second, much brighter, um, more sustained eruption. And the question then becomes is just, just a final um, sort of death gasp, and then you have a supernova explosion, or is there a, a, a kind of shorter eruption, a, a less, uh, mat, a less um, energetic erup eruption, and then with a, a lot of shock interaction, are you having the second event here? So these are interesting objects that, um, having a lot more baseline um, in the Rubin and Roma era, era, we should be able to find a lot more of these and get a bigger, a better idea of what these objects entail. Um, I'm just going to very briefly mention these intermediate luminosity transients, um, objects like 2008S and GCD300OT. Um, these are objects that had their progenitors uh, seen in the red, and they um, but, but in the optical, there was no progenitor found. And it seems to be that they're, they're likely super AGB stars. So these are on the low end of the massive star regime. They're possibly terminal events. So these are not um, just eruptions. These are actual explosions ending in, in an event. Um, but they create quite a lot of dust. They're already dusty and then they create more dust. So finding the progenitor is quite hard. And that is where um, these, uh, where, uh, Roman will really help us out. So if you look at 2008S and NGC 300, um, as you probe, so this is 4.5 microns, as you probe you, uh, out around 3,000 days, it's actually fainter than the progenitor detection. So something is there, but the question is, is that just still a, an infrared echo, is still an afterglow, and the actual um, progenitor has is gone? Or um, is it just that the dust has gotten so thick that there's something there and, and we can't um, see it. And so that's why following these guys in the infrared and seeing if there actually is um, an object still there or if it was a terminal explosion will be of use. Um, and just briefly, 
a very interesting thing about all of these different gap transients is that if you take a spectrum, especially on discovery or when they're at peak, they all look very similar, as in they all have intermediate or narrow emission lines of Balmer emission lines that make them really hard to distinguish. So having the ancillary um, optical and infrared photometry and evolution is, is crucial to help determine um, what these guys are and how they evolve. And so basically that um, boils down to the fact that you have episodic and eruptive mass loss in, uh, is a common occurrence for massive stars. Um, and while these eruptions are interesting in their own right, and it's wonderful to understand how massive star evolution occurs, um, it helps frame our understanding of how pork lab supernovae occur and what types you get with respect to mass loss. Um, so Roman will be invaluable at probing these dust and strata transients and will aid in differentiating between terminal and non-terminal transients and be wonderful at helping us um, search and find these pre-supernova outbursts. So with that, I think I'm right on time. Thank you very much, Jennifer. There are no, not yet any questions in the chat, so I will jump in again with the question that I have. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you can maybe say a few sentences about um, pre-supernova outbursts, and especially within the literature, they are often labeled as a degree like outbursts. And I'm wondering how this fits in in with your other gap transients in terms of physical uh, mechanism that may be shared between the LBVs and these pre-supernova outbursts, or if it's simply an a sharing of the same observables? I think the sample is so small now, um, even though there are, um, there's been tons of literature search and, and you see that, you know, there's at least about three or four magnitude difference between the precursor outburst and the, the terminal event. So um, for some of these objects, we are hitting the detection threshold. And so finding the, the precursor outburst is not um, feasible. It's it's unknown if they are the same physical, um, if they're the same physical mechanism, or if they just both they just look like a um, a similar uh, mechanism there. And I think it does seem to be that in some of these events, like I'm pretty sure to 2009 IP and maybe 15 BH, whether it was terminal or not, showed sort of the same thing. And, and it looks to be sort of instability um, that happens right before the final explosion. So in that instance, um, it does seem to be a very similar mechanism among all of these. But these are sort of, uh, a lot of these are quite isolated. Maybe they're in a cluster. Um, so maybe they have a small companion that we couldn't see. Um, so binarity hasn't been ruled out, but it's um, it seems to be unlikely. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I think there are no other questions. Then thanks again for the nice overview.